Good evening. Welcome to the Boston Public Library's local history lecture series. As part of our program, we want to read the following statement to bring attention to the land which we use for our building and events. We acknowledge that the Boston Public Library's central library stands on land that was once a water-based ecosystem providing sustenance for the indigenous Massachusetts people and is a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. We are committed to land acknowledgements for all locations at which we operate. We reaffirm this commitment to set the context for our planning, deliberations, and public engagement, which will take place from the spirit of welcome and respect found in our motto, free to all. Tonight, we are very pleased to have Elena Palladino here to talk about her book, Lost Towns of the Swift River Valley, Drowned by the Quabbin. Elena Palladino grew up in Sturbridge, Massachusetts, and lives with her family in Ware. She holds a BA in English from Simmons College, an MA in Literary and Cultural Studies from Carnegie Mellon University, and a Master of Education in Higher Education from Harvard University. She works in higher education in Western Massachusetts. This is her first book. Questions will be taken at the end of the lecture. The lecture is being recorded. Copies of the book will be for sale after the program. Thanks for coming and enjoy the lecture. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here in Boston with you tonight. My name's Elena, and I'm here to talk about my book, uh, Lost Towns of the Swift River Valley, which just came out in October. So Lost Towns is about the Quabbin Reservoir, which is Boston's enormous water supply that's located in western central Massachusetts. And I'm going to just start by sharing a few facts about the Quabbin because they always amaze me. <clears throat> so the Quabbin has a capacity of 412 billion gallons of water. It's nearly 20 miles long north to south, and the watershed covers an area of nearly 40 square miles. So it's, it's an enormous body of water right in the center of the state. And it serves more than 3 billion people um, in about 40 towns. The vast majority are in eastern Massachusetts, although there are three in western Mass that get Quabbin water. They are Chicopee, Wilbraham, and a part of South Hadley. Um, and I'm just curious, how many of you have been to the Quabbin? Wow, awesome. So, so many of you are familiar with it then. Okay, so the Quabbin was built from the late 20s through the late 1930s, and it was the last stop on Boston's westward journey to get an, an adequate and clean water supply for its growing city. In April 1938, the towns of Enfield, Dana, Prescott, and Greenwich, which comprised the Swift River Valley, were disincorporated to build the reservoir. And in order to build the reservoir, all bodies buried in valley cemeteries had to be exhumed and moved. Um, all structures were relocated or were raised and burned. Um, all brush was cut to the ground and removed or burned, and all organic matter was removed before the valley began to fill with the water of the Swift River. The engineers also built two impoundment structures in the southern part of the valley to hold in the water. Those are the Windsor Dam and the Goodnow Dyke. Um, they're in the Ware Belchertown area. The reservoir started to fill in 1939, and it was completely full by 1946. So if you've been there before, you know, the Quabbin today is just a beautiful place um, to walk, bike, and enjoy nature. But of course, um, we, I think, should remember that it was, it's a beauty born of sadness and loss for more than 2,000 people who had to leave their homes. And for some of them, they were generational homes um, so that the reservoir could be built. So my book tells the story of the creation of the reservoir through the stories of three individuals who lived in one of those towns, Enfield. Um, and then they all three later moved to Ware. Um, and, but I'm gonna start, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the book, but I'm gonna start by telling the more personal story of how I came to write this book. So just over seven years ago, um, my family and I just moved to, um, from Framingham, Mass, to Ware. And we bought this historic home. It's a colonial revival, um, and it is beautiful and, and big, but my husband and I were just drawn to it right away as we were uh, ready to move. And um, after we bought it and moved in, our neighbors, we heard our neighbors calling it the Quabbin House. And so we weren't aware of this history um, 
before we, before we bought the house. And the rumor we heard was that the house had been moved fully intact from Enfield to Ware, which we weren't sure was true given the size of the house, but that we knew the house was completed in 1939. So the years matched up and we thought that there might be a connection there. And luckily, a previous owner had started to do some research and so our immediate neighbor was able to give us the name of the woman who built the house, and her name was Marion Andrews Smith. So with that information, we were able to do a little bit of internet sleuthing, but there wasn't a whole lot to find about Marion on Google. So my husband, Matt, bought me a copy of this book, um, The Lost Valley, for my birthday in 2016. This book was um, compiled in the 1940s and 50s by this man, Donald Howe. He grew up in Enfield, but moved to Ware. Um, and he had a radio station in Ware, and in the 1950s, he put out a call to former Valley residents to submit their stories and um, memories, and, and he would put them in this book. So The Lost Valley is a 600-page book. It's enormous, but it, it's still such a wonderful collection of photos, memories, poems, um, anecdotes from, from Valley life. And so I, I hoped Marion was in this book, and she was, not just once or twice, but really throughout the book, there were references to her and her family. And this was because um, her family owned a mill, a woolen mill, called the Swift River Manufacturing Company, which was located in a village of Enfield called Smith's Village. And um, her father and uncle ran that company for many years, and then later her two brothers ran it, and they sold it in 1912. So um, Marion and her mother Lorraine were, all, were really active in the community and they were among the first women to lead the library association in town. They were active in the congregational church and they founded an important cultural club in the valley called the Quabbin Club and it was a, a women's club that um, focused on different social issues of the time and had speakers come to the valley and things like that. Um, I was also able to find photos of Marion's family home. This is their large Victorian built in 1896. They called it Bonnie View. And um, before that, the family lived in a home on the same land. So my husband also was able to contact the builder of our house. It's a company called HP Cummings, which is still in existence. They used to be based in Ware. And they actually still had the records of the construction of our house, which said and confirmed for us that Marion had taken the staircase, the floors, the trim, and the doors from this house and used them when she built our house in Ware in 1938 and 39. Um, and we, we also learned that she, took some of her, the spaces from this house, um, some of the spaces in, in her new house and where she had modeled after this house. So for example, our foyer looks very similar to the foyer that she had in Enfield. So we really enjoyed learning about Marion and, and about the valley, but didn't do any more research for a couple years. But then in the fall of 2018, this envelope appeared in our mailbox. Um, there was no stamp, no return address, and it was just these two photos of our house from around the time it was built. Um, and we still don't know who sent it or left it, but um, it got both of us, my husband and I, so excited because we took it to mean that people in town knew about our house, um, remembered our house, knew the history of our house, that there was just some connection there. And, um, and it felt just like a mysterious surprise to me. So it sent me back doing a lot more research on Marion and the house. Um, I went to UMass has a special collection on the valley. Um, the Swift River Valley Historical Society in New Salem has a lot of the valley's records, photos, um, memories. And also the Quabbin Visitor Center in Belchertown has all of the valley's vital records and engineering records. So I started to do some more digging and I began to learn more about Marion Smith. And, um, in particular, who she was and what she stood for. And I also began to focus on what would become a central question of my research, which was, um, what did it feel like to have to leave the valley? What was Marion's experience like? And her story offered an answer from the perspective of an older resident whose family who had lived in Enfield for generations. She was in her 70s and she, she didn't want to leave. So she was the last surviving member of this important family 
And really sadly, this must have been very difficult for her. Her mother and her two brothers died in the decade that the reservoir was being built. So she had a lot of, experienced a lot of loss during those 10 years. She and her two brothers never married or had any children. So she truly was the last in this family and the heir to a, a large family fortune. And though she had greater resources and education than most in the valley, I couldn't find evidence of her using her voice in a really loud way uh, against the reservoir. But what I did find was that she resisted in small ways. Um, and maybe that these were the ways that felt possible for her as a woman during that time. She refused to be buried in the state-sponsored burial ground, Quabbin Park uh, Cemetery, which is located on Route 9. Um, the Commonwealth would move the bodies that had been exhumed from Valley Cemeteries there for free. Um, but she wanted nothing to do with the state at that point. And so she selected a cemetery in Springfield and paid quite a bit of money to have her family moved there. But she also went a step further and she continued to have her family members, her two brothers and her mother, buried in Enfield in the early 1930s, even though she knew she would have to have them exhumed just a couple years later. So this really um, sort of astounded me and I wondered if she was being defiant or else a little bit in denial, but um, that was a, a difficult decision that she made. She also was one of the very last people to leave Enfield in the summer of 1938. She stayed there until the very end when there were very few residents left. Um, and she wouldn't sell her home to the state. So her home and land were eventually taken by eminent domain, though later she did settle with the state. Um, and she died just a couple years after moving to Ware in 1944. And um, in the course of my research, I learned something else about her too, which is that even though her immediate family members had died, she had another family living with her. And so this family is the Tryons, Delia and Earl, they were her housekeeper and chauffeur. And they had a daughter that they named Marion. So Marion, little Marion, called Marion Smith Nana. And um, they moved with her to Ware. And um, they, it must have been, I think, a comfort to Marion Smith to have this family and this child living with her. Um, so this is a photo from the Springfield Republican that was taken on the night of the farewell ball, which is uh, in, in 1938, which was the night that the four towns were disincorporated. And um, this is Marion and Marion. And the caption in the newspaper said that these two would no longer be seeing each other <clears throat> now that the towns no longer existed. And this, of course, wasn't true because they would actually be moving together to where. But it, the photo and the caption really captured how poignant this night was for the people of the valley and I think tried to convey the sadness of what was happening to these people. So I became really interested in trying to find this woman, Marion Tryon. Um, and this was in 2019, so I tried to Google her and um, find the address of someone. I, I found the address of someone I thought might be her, not an email, but a, a real address. So I wrote her a letter. Um, I told her who I was and where I lived, and I included this photo and just said how much I would love to, to speak with her. And a week later, she called me. And she was in her 80s, and she was living in nearby town, the Brookfields still living in the same home that her family moved to after they left Ware in the 40s. And um, we got to know each other, and we had several phone calls. Um, she visited the house a couple times. We actually visited Marion Smith's grave in Springfield together because she had never had the opportunity to, to do that as a child. And she shared many photos and mem memories with me about both Enfield and about growing up in the house in Ware, where she lived from about eight to 14 years old. And just a fun little aside, this is my second daughter, Marion. Marion. <laughs> so she's actually the third Marion to live in our house. We named her that, of course, knowing Marion Smith's name, but she was born in 2017 before I had really started my research. So I didn't even know that the second Marion existed. So just kind of a, a cool thing. So this is Marion Tryon in front of the new house and where in, um, probably 1939 or 40, so she was about nine or 10. And um, this is just to give you a sense of how similar the two foyers were. The photo on the left is Marion Tryon in Enfield, and um, the photo on the right is our house. And the staircase was moved intact from Enfield, although you see the newel post is a little different, and I, I don't 
I don't know why that is, but all of the trim and the, um, the dimensions even, you can see how, how similar they are between the two spaces. And this is another fun photo. This is Marion uh, Tryon in Enfield on a piano bench at a different piano. That's a Steinway piano she's at. This is my house and where, and so Marion Tryon's son, Mark, still had this piano bench and he gave it to us and you can see it's still upholstered in the same fabric and everything. So that's back in wear with us now too, which is pretty cool. Okay, so, um, so I, you know, I felt like I had enough material on Marion to write a book because there was just so much to discover about her and sh um, she had done so much in town. So I reached out to a publisher and said I'd be, you know, I would, I would be interested in writing this book and, and they asked if I could expand it to, to more individuals from the Valley. So two people kept standing out to me as I was doing my research. The first is Dr. Willard Seeger. He was the Valley's country doctor and he was actually a transplant. He was born in Ohio, educated at Princeton and Dartmouth, and he settled in the Valley in 1895. And he was probably like one of the most prominent residents of Enfield, very well known to people in the Valley and even outside of the Valley. He was a true country doctor. He traveled by horse and carriage or horse and sleigh to visit his patients. He had an office in town as well. Um, he had one of the first cars in the Valley and he was also really active in town. He was the chair of the Board of Selectmen for many years, um, on the school board, chief of the Firemen's Association, town physician, on and on and on. But he, he just gave back to his community in a really significant way. He represented Enfield at Quabbin-related hearings locally and also in Boston. And he presided over the last town meeting and planned the farewell ball. Um, the second person that really stood out to me was this man, Edwin Howe. He was the postmaster and general store owner in Enfield. And he was the sixth generation of Howes in Enfield. Um, and there were many branches of the Howe family. He was active in the congregational church as a deacon and a trustee. And he met his wife, Annie, in the valley while he was on the school board and she was a teacher. And they had three sons who were also um, well, so Edwin also ran, he ran the post office, the telephone exchange, and his store. And he had three sons who helped him with those things and were very civic minded. And it was his son, Donald, who wrote that book that I showed you earlier, The Lost Valley. So this is a photo of uh, Edwin and Doc from the Globe, and it was also used in the Springfield Papers in April 1938. And what I didn't realize about Doc and Edwin was that they were even more similar to each other and to Marion than I realized at the start. <clears throat> they also refused to be buried in Quabbin Park Cemetery due to their um, ill will toward the state. Doc is buried in Ware and Edwin's buried in Belchertown. They were also among the last to leave the valley that summer. They all moved to Ware and Doc and Edwin were actually neighbors in Enfield and then were neighbors in Ware. They, they moved just two houses down from each other in Ware. And they also died within a few years of um, leaving Enfield and Doc actually died just a few months later. He died in January of 1939. So Doc and Edwin, like Marion, also gave very generously of themselves to Enfield in the decades prior to the reservoir. And this was especially a parent at Enfield's 1916 centennial. So this is the event that I use in the first section of the book to talk about Enfield as it was before the reservoir. Um, and the centennial was a huge event for the people of Enfield. They went all out for this big celebration over 4th of July weekend in 1916. Um, Doc, Marion, and Edwin were all part of the planning. They were all in attendance. Um, there were, you know, church services, speakers, music, old home day events, and there was a parade on the last day that drew over 8,000 spectators, according to newspapers, which is really remarkable considering the town had about 1,000 residents. Um, and the centennial took place about 10 years before the Ware and Swift River Acts were passed to build the Quabbin. But what I found really fascinating is that even at this time in 1916, the people of the valley knew that the reservoir was a possibility. And this is because in 1895, a report was written that advocated for the construction of the Wachusett Reservoir. 
And it said that if Wachusett wasn't enough water for Boston, and it probably wouldn't be for very long, that the state could always look further west to the Ware and Swift rivers and for more water, and that they could build an inexpensive conduit to connect the two systems. So Donald Howe talks about, in his book, The Lost Valley, how even, even at that point, a, a shadow was cast over the valley. Um, so in the second part of the book, I talk about Boston's need for water and kind of go, go into that history, which was present even from its inception in 1630. So the Puritans originally had selected present-day Charlestown for their settlement, but they then moved to the Shawmut Peninsula because it had freshwater springs. Um, and Boston's quest for ample supply of fresh water continued from that point on. The first system that delivered water was from Jamaica Pond. In 1845, a reservoir was constructed at Long Pond in Natick, now, which was renamed the Kachichuit Reservoir. Um, and a number of other reservoirs were constructed and connected with Kachichuit, which comprised the Sudbury system, which you can see to the left of Boston there. Um, but with the advent of indoor plumbing and the exponential population increase because of immigration in the late 1800s, Boston was in dire need of water. So in 1895, the state commissioned an expert to consider expanding resources. And in that report, they looked at a few other options. So they looked at Lake Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire, but that was very complicated because it required crossing state lines. Um, they considered the Merrimack River, but that was notoriously polluted at the time, and so it would have required filtration. Um, and it was in this report that it was, it was said that, you know, this is, the Wachusett would be an ideal solution because it would be gravity fed, it wouldn't re require pumping, and the water was very pure and it would not require filtration. So it was sort of an ideal solution from an engineering perspective. And the Ware Swift River project, if, if they ever needed it, was very similar. It, it also would be fed by gravity. It also would not require filtration. So as I said, following the publication of this report, Donald Howe described the shadow of the reservoir sort of descending, descending over the Swift River Valley. And you know, many valley residents, of course, sort of thought it would never come to pass, but it was, it was sort of looming for them. And in the meantime, the state completed Wachusett in 1906. And in order to do that, 1,700 people had to be moved, but no full towns were disincorporated to build Wachusett. And in fact, many of the people took, who had to leave their homes took the money from the state and just moved elsewhere in town. So community wasn't necessarily lost in the same way that it was later in the Swift River Valley. And this is a before and after of Wachusett. <clears throat> And at the same time, other cities were doing this too. So New York was in the midst of building reservoirs upstate. And one, the Ashokan, was completed in 1916, that year after Enfield's centennial. And that required the removal of 2,000 um, residents, which was a lot like the Quabbin. And these projects were known to the people from the valley because they, um, they were reported in newspapers, both the Wachusett and the New York projects. So by the time Boston was looking for more water, yet again, around 1920, the Valley people, I think, were a little bit resigned to their fate because it had been decades that they knew this could happen. And in the meantime, they saw all of these other projects taking place. So at hearings in the 1920s, they of course expressed their opposition. And there were hearings, there were a couple hearings in the Valley, there were many hearings in Boston. Um, they expressed their opposition, but they also said at these hearings that they knew this would probably have to happen, probably would happen. And so what they asked is that it just happen as quickly as possible so that they wouldn't have to wait any longer. But even still, it took um, years for the decision to be made. The Ware and Swift River Acts were passed in 1926 and 27. So part three of the book is um, about the sort of decade of destruction from 1928 to 1938, when the Quabbin was actually being built. Um, first, the aqueduct from the Wachusett to the Quabbin was constructed in the late 1920s, so that would have still been a fairly quiet time for the people of the valley. And then engineers started to arrive in the valley in droves to begin the work on the dam and the dike, which um, were both built at Enfield. 
And um, they, the engineers also did a lot of preparatory work in that time before they began to dismantle the valley. They marked property boundaries, they photographed every structure and piece of property, and they also photographed every cemetery plot and gravestone. Um, and then, you know, starting in the mid-30s, things really started to pick up the pace. So the, there was a, val, um, a railroad that ran through the valley north to south, and that sort of was the valley's lifeline. It connected it with the other main railways that ran north and south of the valley. Um, they pulled up the tracks of that railroad in 1935. Um, <clears throat> in that time, 1935, 1936, they started the project of exhuming all 7,500 graves in the valley and moving them elsewhere. Um, and in the summer of 1936, things got very real and thousands of young men w who were there to cut, cut the brush below the waterline descended on, on the valley and on, they, many of them lived in Ware, a neighboring town that summer. And they were young men who the valley people came to call woodpeckers because they felt that they were really inexperienced. Um, you know, they were from the city. They didn't grow up in the country. They didn't know how to cut wood as, as quickly or as efficiently as many people in the valley did. So they had this, this nickname for them. And these young men developed a reputation for being pretty wild. They were lazy, irresponsible. There were a lot of car accidents and things like that. Um, and so many of them, not many, there were some that were let go from the project. And that same summer, just as the Enfield Congregational Church was preparing to celebrate its 150th anniversary, it was burned to the ground just a week before that celebration. This was just totally heartbreaking to the people of the valley. They were um, just devastated by it. And though no one was charged, um, the valley people suspected it was a disgruntled woodpecker who had been maybe released from the project. Um, over the course of the next couple years, the valley was slowly emptied of its people and buildings. All of the social organizations were disbanded. Throughout these years, people were leaving. They were taking money from the state and going elsewhere. And there was just sort of a hardcore group of people, including those three in my book, who, who stayed until the very end. Um, by 1938, most structures in town were, were gone or were dilapidated and awaiting demolition. And the photo on the left is the town's main street at some point in 1938. Um, and in April 1938, the town held its last town meeting and also a farewell ball that they um, billed as a last good time for all. So this is the event where my book begins with the, in the prologue and then it returns to later in the book. And this is, I think, just such a, it really captured my imagination, this event. Um, it was one of the first parts of the book that I wrote and um, Marion, Doc, and Edwin were all there and thousands of people came. The hall could hold a couple hundred and they sold um, tickets to people who couldn't even get in. Supposedly there were a thousand people in the hall and another thousand or two who were just kind of hanging around um, that night. Doc planned the event and in this photo of the Grand March, he's the man in the front in the center, that's his wife Laura to the left and the leader of the orchestra to the right. Um, he, Doc, Doc really planned the whole thing and he also held a moment of silence at midnight when the towns officially passed. And this was a really emotional moment for the people of the valley. Um, this is how Donald Howe described it in the Lost Valley. He wrote, muffled sobs could be heard from all parts of the hall and many hardened men were noted making hurried grasps for their handkerchiefs. Children broke into tears as all realized this was the last gathering of its kind in Enfield and for that matter, about the last affair of any kind to take place in the community. And after this moment of silence at midnight, the orchestra began to softly play Old Lang Syne. Um, and then the, the, the party event continued until 2 a.m. So this really, I think, is just a really important moment for the Valley. And I think Doc Seeger really kind of led the Valley towns through this this end of the town's life, both presiding over that last town meeting and then planning this, this important event for them. Um, so I'm gonna wrap up now and, and I'll just say that though many people of the valley opposed the reservoir and didn't wanna leave their homes, 
in the end, some expressed understanding that the needs of the many of Boston outweighed the needs of the few, fewer in the valley. And um, I'm gonna end by reading a poem that's actually at the end of my book as well. It's written by an Enfield woman named Mary Cushman Hardy, and she wrote it for the Quabbin Club when it disbanded in 1938. It's called Quabbin Elegy, and I think it speaks to the generosity and hope that some people of the Valley felt that their sacrifice would be remembered and appreciated, and it also anticipates the, view, the beauty of the Valley, and it, which um, the Quabbin is today. <clears throat> so she wrote, I am not dying, new life is mine, great honor has come to me, for high and low shall drink of my wine in the vintage of memory. My time is coming, but not quite yet, my jewels I've sent to be reset, and the hills my sparkling wine shall find, for I am the cupbearer of all mankind. The sun shall fling his crimson robe across my waters clear, and the amber of the soft moonlight shall, shall guide the timid deer. The little creatures of the wood shall come and visit where the friendliness of solitude shall spread the mantle rare. And when on bended knee I raise my cool and jeweled cup, if the waters lower neath its brim, the gods shall fill it up. The gods of snow and ice and rain, the gods of the slumbering hills, the gods who take and give again, who grind their shadowing mills. But say not death has come to me, beauty not dust you'll find, for I stand among my towering hills, cupbearer to all mankind. So my, my wish for this book is that it helps to keep the memory alive of what these people sacrificed so that Boston could continue to thrive. And I thank you for your time and attention and I'd be happy to take any questions. So I'll say that there is a microphone for folks to ask questions and yeah, looks like one woman here is ready to get us started, yeah. Thank you so much. I enjoyed that tremendously. Um, you mentioned once or twice that there had been something called a Quabbin Club. Yeah. So I take it the name Quabbin was already in the, in the area. Um, yes. Was there a village with that name or, or anything? So there, the Nipmuc people lived in the Swift River Valley before um, the settlers did. And they had a settlement that they called Quabbin, which means the meeting of many waters. And so that settlement was where Enfield later was at the meeting of the branches of the Swift River. So it took on new, new meaning, I think, with the reservoir. Is that a Native American word? I think yes. it probably yes. is, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's a wonderful story, and you have. That's a wonderful story, and you have a beautiful house. Thank you. I wondered about. Uh, you mentioned that some people's homes were transferred intact. To, yeah. About how many of those would have been? That's a great question. So I, I don't have a um, a concrete answer for you. They did not keep. Uh, records of that. So some homes were sold um, and were moved, and there are many around the Quabbin that were moved, and there's also a small village of homes from Enfield that are located in Dorset, Vermont today. Um, there also were homes that were auctioned off, purchased, and then pieces might have been taken. And so, it, it, you know, as I've done talks in local libraries around the Quabbin, people will say, oh, I grew up in a house that had you know, pieces that came from a Quabbin house, or there's even apparently a house in Ware that was cut in half to be moved and then reassembled, and so there's a crack <laughs> across the ceiling. Um, so I don't know, but actually one, it's something I'm very interested in, maybe trying to catalog some of these Quabbin houses where they are and, and who own them. Thank you, it's a fascinating story. Yeah, thank you. Was, was there any uh, monetary compensation uh, given by the state you know, yes. to the people and about you know, how much in, in today's money value would be? 
Yeah, um, so they were compensated and of course, the Commonwealth thought it was fair compensation. This was during the depression um, and the people of the Valley, many people did not think it was fair. They gave money for homes and land. They did not compensate for business lost. So you can imagine what it would have been like for someone to have to try to reestablish a business in a different town after having one in the community. So um, I, I think you'll kind of get conflicting answers as to whether it was fair, but they were compensated. Thank you. Uh, so was where the most popular town for the Swift River Valley evacuated people? So I think um, Ware and Belchertown were very popular for the people who lived in the southern part of the valley in Enfield. Um, a lot of people who lived in Dana or Prescott went north, so there were a lot of transplants in Athol and Orange and Gardner in that area. Um, I also have heard about quite a few residents who moved to the Brookfields. Um, so I think that I think that the places around the valley were definitely the most popular destinations when folks had to leave, but people kind of went in different directions. Thank you. Can you describe um, what was the left prior to uh, the flood of the, the flooding of the valley? Was there anything left standing at all? No. No, and there still are rumors that, you know, there's a church steeple underneath the water and things like that. No buildings were left. Um, everything was removed. There was a documentary, a PBS documentary that was done in the 80s or the 90s called Under Quabbin, and they actually sent a team on, to dive under the water. They did find a few things, um, you know, remnants of stone walls. They found um, one or two gravestones which doesn't necessarily mean that they had missed exhuming a grave, but that there were, there were a few things that were left underneath, but there were no buildings, no trees, you know, no brush. Um, they had done a pretty good job of removing all of that. Yeah, yeah Diane, I see someone over there. Hi, um, I was just curious, this sounds kind of serendipitous, the story seemed to have found you. Yeah. And I'm a little curious about yourself, assuming that you hadn't planned on the story finding you and you doing this, like what, what were you doing before this and how has this changed you yeah. um, in getting into this? Well, you know, I always loved old houses when I was a kid. I grew up in Sturbridge and I love driving through Southbridge, which is an old mill town that's a lot like Ware. So I, it is kind of amazing that we moved into this house with this great history. I think that's why I pursued the research was because it was something I have always loved and been interested in. I was working in, um, I worked at Harvard in Cambridge. I got a job at Smith College in Northampton. So that was what prompted the move to where. And um, yeah, I don't know, it's just, it's been an amazing adventure and I've loved sort of getting to know Marion Smith and feeling very connected to her in a very personal way because I'm living in her home. Um, so yeah, I don't know, it's just been, just been a, a wonderful experience and I feel very privileged to have um, come in contact with the story and been able to share it with people. Um, thank you. Did this change your perspective on water use and water conservation? And do you have a, a, a thought on um, the sufficiency of the Quabbin going forward and what they thought of the Wachusett, you know, with, you know, generally around that? Yeah. Um, well, I think the Quabbin is more, you know, it's, it's more than sufficient um, for these towns. I will say one thing that I find really striking is that in where our, we have town water and it is really not a good system, it's very old. And there's something kind of difficult <laughs> about living so close to this very pristine water supply and having the supply of many of these towns in the Quabbin area be not, not that. Um, I think that there's, what I've learned in doing this research is that you know more than two thirds of the rivers in the world are um, dammed and that's for hydropower, for reservoirs, for various things. 
um, and that that has affected, you know, ecosystems and, um, and habitats and things like that. So, you know, I, I, think, I think that this project did have a positive impact on the overall state of Massachusetts and that um, like the people of the Valley felt in the end that it sort of was inevitable. I don't know that these projects, they're not happening anymore, but so many of them did happen at this one point in time. Um, and there's, there's sort of no going back, but of course you wonder, I do wonder if there were other solutions that would have worked, if they could have filtered um, and, and treated another source that would have been adequate for Boston. It would not have been such a simple solution though. It would probably be something that Boston was going to continue to have to um, Im, you know, work on and improve over time, whereas the Quabbin is just sort of a very complete solution for the city. I don't know where, to, oh, it's, she's going up there and then she'll come down here. I'm very curious as to um, when you moved into your home, did it um, have to be rehabbed or was it in good shape because of the move and have you had to do things to it that um, have you stayed in in respected the house and kept it the way that it was built. Yeah, so we're very fortunate because there was a, a couple who owned our home, not the exact previous owners, um, but the, the ones before that from about 2000 to 2010. And my understanding is they did quite a bit of work to the house. So the house is in beautiful shape and they did quite an, a few projects like the kitchen and things like that. So. We're very lucky that it looks the way it does today. A lot of the, the wood has been painted, which is the only thing that I really think is a shame and we could at some point try to, to take some of that off. But um, the house is very much the way it was when it was built. There was um, a carport, like a, a coche, port cocher or whatever that it would be called that went across the driveway. And that's the only thing that we can see that's been removed. Otherwise, the house is, is pretty much as it was when it was built. Um, so we feel very fortunate and, and just sort of, sort of see ourselves as stewards of the house. You know, I, I hope that we can just maintain it so that it stays in as good of shape as it is now. Yeah. Diane, there were a couple people down here. I don't know if there was anyone else up there who had questions. You said that this is your first book. Yeah. Are you working on another book now? I am not yet. I, I would love to. I mean, this story just felt it's like so um, personal and it was easy to write. I, I, would, I would love to write another book, but I, I don't have any uh, project that's captured my attention at the moment. It looks like you could pass it right behind you if you can reach, yeah. So the surrounding towns, were they given any incentives to welcome the, um, the residents or, um, so what was that like for the, the, the surrounding towns that end up having this influx? That's a great question. I, I don't know that there were any incentives, but I know that some towns like Belchertown, for example, they had welcome gathering for all of the residents who moved there. Um, and they had like an Enfield day where they would um, welcome people. So I think, I think that some towns made efforts to do that, but I don't know that they were, you know, that that, that was something that they all did. Was there, did you, yeah, there's two down, two down here, Diane. Right here. Um, I, I came here because I live in the Quabbin and I'm visiting and I just happened to notice this on the 
lecture Fun. schedule today, <laughs> which was pretty cool. And I live in a very old house, so. Um, but um, something that hadn't occurred to me is that the entire dissolution of a community actually, you know, could be relevant. I know this is sort of a dark question, but I was thinking, like, when could this happen again? And, yeah. You know, as our coastal towns and cities are getting flooded, mm -hmm. um, you know, I can yeah. imagine that something like this could happen in the future. And is that something that's occurred to you? Do you sort of, like, project forward about, like, other ways that this historical story could happen again? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I get that question a lot. Like, this couldn't happen again, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I wish I could I'd say no, but I actually suspect that it could, given the right circumstances, and I think that m could be one of them. Um, you know, uh, people come up to me at these talks and say, you know, my grandparents' house was taken by eminent domain to build 91. Or, you know, there's these smaller examples that are, are still happening and I think happen quite more frequently than you might think. Um, whether a whole town could be taken again, I, I don't know. But there are big infrastructure projects that are moving people and affecting people's water and, and things like that, like pipelines and other things. So, and with the climate crisis, I think that in the future there it is possible that things um, that it will you know people will have to will have to move, or people will be moved into new spaces. Yeah. It always surprised me to hear that uh, the, the nearby towns don't have access to Quab and, yeah. and water. And you know, was curious if there's a particular reason for that. So the aqueduct that serves um, Chicopee and Wilbraham was added in the 40s, 50s. It was after the project. And I know in where recently we were talking about whether we, c we could access Quabbin water. And I think the answer may be yes, but of course it would be at quite an expense and it would fall to the town. Um, so I, I, think it, I think it's a possibility. I don't think it's uh, you know, anything that anyone is considering in a real way right now though. I uh, was, have been out there and found the whole story great. I'm very interested in your book. I also am very interested in um, my, I come from an architectural background, and um, the, uh, in the 19th century, there were very beautiful houses built, and it's really very sad to see what's happened to very many of them. And in your house, um, I, I'm restoring a house in the Jamaica Plains section of Boston where I live, that it was just stunning to see how the, uh, how Mrs. Smith was able to try to retrieve what she could. Yeah. And if you just look at the house you live and look at the house that she had, if you have an architectural eye, it's sort of like, gee, isn't that sad? Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Have you uh, thought to do further restoration work? Um, is there any, you know, Yeah, I mean, as I said, I would, I would love to remove the paint because there's a lot of white paint on this woodwork. And, and a, a, a Common news, thing to do. Yeah, yeah. and See the newspaper the articles, it said that there were many rare woods in the house. So I don't know a lot about that, what they are or what they would look like, but that's something I would be interested in doing. I mean, otherwise, I just love that it, I'd like to think that it feels the way it felt for her, you know, that she had some strong intention. And um, one of the things that was really interesting in that contract from the, the builder was that they, they talk, commented on how difficult she was to work with. There was a cost overrun of like a third of the project estimated, estimated cost, and they said that she was making changes every day, and it was very frustrating to work with her. So I think that she, she made it what she wanted to, and I don't blame her. And so I would like, you know, to leave it a as it is, and, and as I said, just keep, maintain it so that it is in good shape going forward. Well, you certainly could do further research on lost houses that have been, yeah. been restored or not, because in my experience, the, a lot, it, um, out in Odetta, Ma Massachusetts, is, um, uh, was one of the finest houses ever built that was then given to, uh, um, to MIT as a, as a conference center. And the house is sort of okay, maintained. There was a world famous rock garden there. Disaster, it's yeah. completely wrecked. Yeah. So, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, thank you for your, uh, for your thoughts. Thank you.
Thank you. <clears throat> I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that there were an awful lot of photographs that were taken of existing houses and structures. Mm -hmm. uh, did they end up in a state archive somewhere that's viewable by uh, John Q. Public, such yes. as us? So in recent years, they are all put online. If you go on digitalcommonwealth.com, uh -huh. uh, you can, and if you search Quabbin and, and by last name or town, you can, you can view all of those photographs nice. from the Valley of the Homes. Mm -hmm. And I think that they just also added more from the Ware River Valley, <coughs> that, um, the, the structures that had to be moved so that the aqueduct could be built and, and that sort of thing. So there, it is all accessible now online, which is so nice. great. Uh, and one, one more question, uh, which I can't remember. Uh, so, we'll leave you alone. <laughs> Great. Well, I think, oh, I see one, one last question, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I used to fish the Quabbin regularly in the 60s, and I noticed that the water level d over the years that I fished it would drop dramatically so that the, the, you, the, the, the place you put in last year was a lot, lot, far, lot farther from the water ne next year. What's yeah. the situation? Is the water, is the water, uh, is the Quabbin going to survive and pro provide enough water for Boston for a long time? or are we have to, going to have to do, it, do something like this again? Yeah, so I, there have been, during periods of drought, the water does recede quite a bit. And I believe there was a time in the 70s that it was it's pretty serious and you could actually see some things from the towns sort of emerging from the water. But I think at this point, it's nearly full. Sometimes it is at capacity. I think the last time I was there, it was, I don't know, around 80 or 90%. So I do think that it is, often full and then during droughts it goes down but i do think it will it will think continue it will what's that you think it will refill itself it does time? yeah it does yeah no, I, I found that disturbing because the, the water the launching level of a boat yeah you, you had to come down 30 or 40 feet to get to get the boat in the water right yeah it's been significant at times and definitely is the fishing still good yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I have a neighbor who is actually also featured in the Boston Globe, and he is a, an avid fisherman and takes people out on the Quabbin, and the fishing is still great from what I hear. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Great. Well, well, thank you all so much. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Diane, there's two. two. Could you just repeat that website? Oh, digitalcommonwealth.com. Yep. Thank you. Mm hmm. Just so thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'd just like to uh, mention the one aspect of, uh, of uh, the, the topic that you haven't addressed, and that's the people that live there and what they did uh, and, the, and all the uh, society that was there. And the uh, Smith's Mill, it was the, the village that was, was known as Smith's, mm -hmm. was uh, built by the Smith River, uh, uh, River Manufacturing, just as you mentioned. And that, that mill was staffed in large part by immigrants from Northern Ireland who came from Porter Down. And there are in the room uh, quite a few descendants of those people. So mm -hmm. we're all here still, and uh, we're still survivors of that uh, exercise. And uh, it is a beautiful place, but uh, it's a, there was a, a number of uh, immigrants that lived in the town that uh, were there at the, until the very end and we're still very much uh, conscious 
that uh, we were disenfranchised by the, uh, by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Yeah. But uh, it was a be beautiful place to live, and uh, we all have very fond memories of the fact that uh, Smith's Village in particular was a, people were very uh, uh, close and very related, both family and by neighborhood. Yeah. But it, it was even more upsetting than uh, uh, you might expect because right. of that closeness. Right. I, I think that the valley uh, overall, Smith's Village certainly, and the valley overall was a very close-knit community. And I think, I think that people whose families had to leave mm -hmm. certainly still carry that with them today. Thank you. I want to I thank you all. <laughs> thank you.